Today's brief has been created with open source information readily available on the internet as well as books. However, take it with a pinch of salt because some aspects have been kept secret due to said country's official secrets act. And sometimes Wikipedia is probably the best place to find the information. So sit back, relax, and let's get into today's briefing. Following on from the preceding Type 052 Bravo class destroyers, or designated by NATO as Luyang 1s, a new anti-air warfare destroyer would be designed, centering around the recently developed Dragon Eye Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar, or ASA for short. This vessel is designed to be using the same hull as the previous class, with her sharp angled bow and good length to beam ratio. Designed by the Zhangneng shipyards in Shanghai, in the eastern part of China, the hulls would follow on quickly from the Bravos, with 52 Bravo Hull 2 being laid down in 2001, with 52 Charlie Hull 1 being laid down in late 2001. Looking at the comparison between the Type 052 Bravo and the up-and-coming Type 052 Charlie at the time, the main visual difference would consist with the forward superstructure. Whether Liu Yang 1 class used a bridge similar to that of something from the Russian Navy, with an enclosed mast with top plate at top, and the aft had a small raised platform with a ray dome for a target acquisitional radar, these Liu Yang 2s would take the same features as that of an Aegis capable vessel that were operating at the time. Spy 1 wasn't a new system at this point, but the design of the main structure for vessels like an Ali Burke, the Congo, and its derivatives, show that the design was good for a low radar cross section and gave a advantage for 360 degrees coverage. Dragon Eye, being an Acer radar, would be designed as a curved emitter, giving the ship reliability in theory that if she was to lose one emitter, the scannable radar waves can be steered from two emitters, still working so that they can keep 360 degrees of coverage. In theory, based off the idea that the system has all four emitters that can work independently from each other. So the Type 052 Charlie would comprise of six vessels of 7,000 tons apiece. They are 157 meters long, have a beam of 17 meters and a draft of six meters. These vessels are Kodog powered vessels of two diesel engines and two DA-80 gas turbines, producing enough power to drive these ships up to 29 knots or 15 knots cruise speed for about 4,500 nautical miles, on Earth range to patrol the East China Sea a few times. Crew complement would be 280 officers and enlisted persons. The ships would be built with an impressive weapons and sensor fit, designed to make them the most capable ships in the People's Liberation Army Navy to date. Each ship is fitted with one Dragon Eye 2 multifunctional dual band ASO radar with four different planier arrays. These are operating in the Echo Foxtrot and Golf Slash Hotel bands, with two emitters per face operating in Echo Foxtrot and one in Golf Slash Hotel. The maximum expected detection range is realistically about 150 nautical miles from a given unit based on the atmospherics. One Type 517 Hotel Knife Wrist Alpha Band Early Warning Radar, designed for long range detection and detection of low radar cross section aircraft. This radar is expected to have a range of about 180 nautical miles, however, is limited to only being a two dimensional radar. One Type 364 Early Warning Golf Slash Hotel Band Radar, this radar again is also two dimensional has an estimated range of about 90 nautical miles. Three cage India band navigational radars with an expected range of about 30 nautical miles. One type 344 fire control radar for the ship's main gun. Two LR66 fire control radar for the type 730 close in weapon systems. And finally, one bandstand fire control radar for the ship's anti-surface missile systems. The ship is armed with two quad YJ-83 Eagle Strike anti-ship missiles located aft of the main mast. The open source keel line is about 215 nautical miles and is a subsonic missile. Eight six barrel vertical launch silos for the HHQ-9 surface-to-air missile system. 
This missile's capabilities are that it can strike a target out 162 nautical miles with a speed of Mark 4.2 and can hit a target flying at a height of 134,000 feet. One 100mm gun located on the bow and is capable of shooting out to 9.4 nautical miles. Two Type 730 30mm close-in weapon systems located forward and aft capable of shooting out to 1.6 nautical miles. Two triple anti-submarine warfare torpedo launchers located in the hull and four 18-barrel rocket launchers for anti-submarine warfare weapons and generalised decoys. The aircraft capabilities of this class will consist of a single hangar capable of housing a Z9 Harbin or a Ka-27 Helix variant. So the class would be built by the Zhangnan shipyards in Shanghai in two batches. The two original ships, DDG-170 and 171, would be laid down in June 2001 and launched on April 29th and October 30th, 2003, commissioning into the People's Liberation Army Navy on July 18th and in December 2005, as the destroyers Lanzhou and Haiku entering service with the Southern Territory Navy, based out of Yulin Naval Base. This is highly likely, based off an image in the background, as you can see here, of the Haiku alongside the East Pier, provided by Google Earth. Now in this image, 170 isn't actually visible in the imagery, which might suggest she's either at sea, or she isn't actually based at Yulin Naval Base. Lanzhou and her sister ship Haiku would start their operational careers off with drills in the South China Sea during 2007. As they were the newest anti-air warfare vessels in the fleet, it was envisioned that they would act as a flagship in operations for Chinese fleets in up-and-coming deployments envisioned by the People's Liberation Army Navy High Command. The plan at the time was they wanted to become a Blue Water Navy and these ships were ideal units to help with that cause. With the operational drills completed and local workup in and around the South China Sea, Lanzhou would take part in the 60th anniversary of the People's Liberation Army Navy in Qingdao. And so she would transit the Taiwanese Strait en route, arriving on April 23rd, 2009. On completion, she met up with the landing platform dock, the Kulun Shan, and two Type 903 class replenishment vessels, for a 17-day naval exercise, which would include the longest replenishment at sea in the plan's history to date. By mid-2010, Lanzhou and her partner, the LPD, Kulun Shan, would sail from China as part of the 5th NEF, or Naval Expeditionary Force, tasked with anti-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden and off the Somali coast, remaining on patrol for an allotted time of about 192 days before returning home. During the deployment, she escorted hundreds of merchant vessels. After returning home, she would enter a fleet-ready support period and a slight refit, fixing defects as such before conducting local operations in the South China Sea. She would become a frequent vessel observed in the disputed waters conducting operations alongside Chinese coast guards and other such operations, including escort for foreign power vessels. Haiku would kickstart her long-range operations earlier than her sister ship, with her first overseas deployment starting in late December 2008. She would sail with the Wuhan, a Luyang 1-class vessel, and a Fuki-class oiler, the Weishan Hu, for the Gulf of Aden to conduct the first overseas naval deployment that China had conducted in about 600 years. She too, like her sister ship, entered a slight maintenance period before doing localised operations in the South China Sea, going to sea at least twice a year until late November 2011, when she deployed on the 10th NEF patrol of the Gulf of Aden, being relieved in March by the 11th NEF. After more maintenance periods and localised training and patrols, she would be allocated to try and help find the missing Malaysian airliner MH370, but to no avail. Not much has actually been seen of this vessel over the last few years, but as the image shown earlier, she was seen in Yulin, naval base, last year. The second tranche of vessels would be staggered, 
with DDG-150 being laid down at some point in 2008, launching on October 28, 2010, and she will be followed by DDG-151, being laid down at some point in 2009, and launching on June 25, 2011. DDG-152 would follow next, laying down as well in late 2009 and launching on December 15, 2011. Finally, DDG-153 was laid down in 2010 and launched on June 16, 2012. In some pictures, you can actually see what I believe is the latter vessel, 153, actually having the same pennant number as the Chengsha. Now, Chengsha is a Type 052 Delta Luyang 3 class destroyer that also holds 173 as a pennant number. What I believe has happened here is they've allocated 173 to the ship, built it, obviously the paint has gone on, they've numbered it 173, and then the first ship of the Luyang 3 class has come in and it's a 172. I believe what's happened here is they've obviously changed it back to 153 to follow on with the rest of her sister ships, and then Chengsha has obviously taken 173 and has progressed on with that. Now, these four vessels would be commissioned into the People's Liberation Army Navy Eastern Territory Navy, being based out of Denghai, near Shanghai. DDG-150 would be christened the Changshun. She would kick off her career with a catch-a-submarine exercise, or it's properly called a KSEX. This was part of an Eastern Territory Fleet Directive that brought elements of the Southern Territory Navy into the fold for multi-fleet liaison. After apparently finding the first submarine, they moved on to test the ship's command and control of a task group and quote-unquote successfully neutralised this four-exercise second submarine. She would also then join up with the Changzhou, a Zhangkai 2 class frigate and a Fuhi class oiler forming the 14th NEF patrol for the Gulf of Aden. En route, she would be redirected to try and help and find the wreckage of the Malaysian airliner MH370. But like her sister ship earlier, she wouldn't be able to find the downed airliner. After staying on station for about a week and a half, she would continue her transit across the Indian Ocean for her escort mission. She remained conducting this operation for 213 days on station, with stops in Jordan, the UAE, Iran, and Pakistan. She returned back to China for maintenance before being put back to sea a year later in 2015, heading out to sea into the Western Pacific on a high-intensity training exercise with the fleet. During this time, Chinese reporters were allowed on board to see what was happening during this period at sea, in which they showed a 24-hour period on board the vessel. But due to the length of this video, they won't be shown here. But there is a link in the description for the naval news report on said pictures. In 2016, she would conduct a local operation in the East China Sea, with frequent times in port for training, maintenance, before being put back to sea in the next year in 2017, where she and a Jiangkai class frigate, the Jingzhu, held a naval exercise in the Strait of Hormuz with a Maoj class destroyer, or as it's easier to know, a Jamaran class. But sources are very hard to work out what this Iranian vessel was called that they actually exercised with. This exercise lasted a maximum of about 10 days, but there was no more information on this vessel that I could find for the last four years of its career. But best guess would be local operations in the East China Sea with barrier patrols near the Japanese territorial waters near Okinawa. DDG-151 would be commissioned as the Zhangzhou. She, like her sister ship Changsha, would be an East Territory naval vessel. Her service career would be more of a PR ship for the first couple of years, with being part of a joint Sino-Russian task group in which she conducted KSEXs, SurfXs, and an at-anchor self-defence exercise. But in addition to this, she was banned many times in port for celebrations and other naval-related events. But back to the real thing. She would make a few interfleet transits and patrols of the East China Sea, with a foray into the West Pacific alongside a Sovereignty 3-class destroyer, two Zhangkai 2-class frigates, 
a Fuki 1 class Euler, and a Dong Dao class AGI. But this wouldn't last that long, and they would be on their way home by mid 2015, for usual East China Sea patrols and refits until Christmas Day of 2016, when the Japanese reported she had formed part of the Lao Ning carrier strike group for her sea trials. This task group would include the Lao Ning, Zengzu, Haiku, Qingxia, Yantai, Yili, Zengzu, or sorry, Zuzu, and the replenishment ship Gaiyohu. A pretty large group of three destroyers, three frigates, and auxiliary. It's unclear if she's still part of the carrier strike group, but it's likely she has been replaced by a Liu Yang 3 class destroyer. DDG 152 would be commissioned as the Jinan into the East Territory Navy. She would form the destroyer aspect of the 20th NEF patrol to the Gulf of Aden alongside the Zhangkai 2, the Ying Yang, and the auxiliary, the Quin Dao Hao. She would relieve the 19th NEF and conduct her escort operations in the Gulf of Aden. After a couple of months on the station, she would be relieved by the 21st NEF, but instead of sailing back across the Indian Ocean, she would sail west into the Atlantic, but into Stockholm and conducting a PASEX and FOSEX with the units of the US Atlantic Fleet. She would also put into Mayport, Florida, and would be the first ship from China to enter Florida. After this port visit, she would sail home with her task group for a maintenance period before conducting local operations in the East China Sea for the rest of the decade. Finally, DDG-153 would be commissioned as the Zayan. She would be assigned to the Eastern Territory Navy. She would spend her first year working in the East China Sea before sailing for RIMPAC 2016, being the flagship for the Chinese task group. This task group, including the Qingdao, a submarine support vessel, the Hengshai, a Jankai 2 class frigate, the Goyoho, a Fuki class auxiliary, and the Peace Arc, a hospital ship. After the completion of the exercise, she transited back to the East China Sea, where she was put into port for defect rectification. Over the next two years, she was seen at sea a few times in the East China Sea, conducting operational patrols local operations before 2019 when she'd be sent on an out-of-area deployment to European waters alongside the Type 071 Yizhou class LPD and an Euler with a port visit to Holland in July 2019. Additionally, she would attend the naval parade in St. Petersburg at the time. Before her return transit, she would sail through the English Channel, being escorted by HMS Westminster. As usual, she conducted a safe and professional transit through the British waters before sailing back home via the Suez Canal. Like her sister ship, she would conduct a maintenance period upon arrival home. She has continued the trend of her sister ships where she has been conducting local operations and patrols in the East China Sea, as well as conducting interfleet transits. Current open source information shows that all units are currently in service, and there is no information about these ships being removed in the near future. Due to the lack of information, I have had to use information that I have observed whilst operating near these vessels, or have seen movements from afar, and as such, the blanks I have found in this research I have filled with such information. Like the beginning of this video states, I have tried to find information that is not from Wikipedia, but unfortunately, as these vessels are Chinese, it seems to be there is only one place to sort of get this information in some sort of chronological timeline. The information provided in this source has been expanded upon and correlated with other such sources in terms of news articles. But nine times out of ten, the articles I have found are either in Chinese, or I've had to input some information to get hold of this said source. And I'd rather not do that due to the fact it is sort of owned by the Chinese government. And as such, unfortunately, this is the best thing I can do. Thank you very much for the watching this video, and I hope you find it informative. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you learned something new. Don't forget to like the video before you leave. Leave a comment and uh, give a suggestion of what you think I should do next. As well as if you have a question you want me to answer, please 
put it in the comment section on the pinned post. Apart from that, if you haven't uh, subscribed to the channel, I recommend doing so because I have some very interesting content coming out very soon. If you want to support the channel, there is a Patreon page, but that's entirely up to you. If you do so, there is some interesting perks to actually being a Patreon to the page. Apart from that, all you need to do is say thank you very much, have a nice day, and uh, here's a sneak peek at uh, next week's video.